Good morning, everybody. It's so nice to be um, with you today. My name is Tanya Rhodes Smith, and I am the director of the Nancy A. Humphreys Institute for Political Social Work. Here with my colleague, um, Dr. Shannon Lane from the Wurzweiler School of Social Work at Yeshiva University. Um, we are so thankful to Deanna for inviting us today. We hope to um, bring you some hope in these heavy times. You know, as we acknowledge um, the weight and uncertainty that this pandemic has brought, the weight of inequality, the compounded weight of racism and violence, you know, voting is one of those things that gives me hope. And I hope you'll see that too, because, you know, I've been an advocate, we've been advocates and macro social workers for, um, for most of our careers. And voting is the pathway that I see for deconstructing racism, for addressing the structural and institutional racism that's built into our democracy and our public policy. And, um, and, and, and there are easy ways it's a continuum for us. There are easy ways for you to get involved. And then there's ways, um, you know, it, there are so many ways for us to be in collaboration. So that's me. I'm going to have um, Shannon advance our next slide. Excuse us in the beginning. It's a little awkward as we, uh, as we navigate the slides, but Shannon. Yep. Good morning, everybody. Um, and uh, like Tanya, I am, and, uh, and like, low in our first session i'm also a macro social worker and a political social worker um and in addition to the the work that i do at the wurtzweiler school of social work um i also am like tanya a, a passionate advocate for voting and voting rights and you know in reflecting on the first session today i think one of the things that's important for me in doing this work is um you know as a as a white woman who's dealing with the world in a way where I'm not directly exp um, experiencing racism every day. I think I have a real opportunity, you know, to be not just an ally but an accomplice, and um, really try to use the the power and privilege that I have to change some of these laws. And that's part of what Tanya and I want to talk to you about is both work that you can do individually with the power of three to get people registered to vote, but also um, when you have the time to step in and step up and have the capacity to do it, the ways that we can change some of these, some of these systems. So you want to talk about the Institute next, Tanya? Yeah, that would be great. So I mentioned earlier, I'm the director of the Nancy A. Humphreys Institute for Political Social Work. And our mission, we were founded um, 26 years ago by Dr. Nancy Humphreys. And our mission is to increase the political participation and the power, not just of social workers, but the communities we serve so that public policy reflects and, and responds to the needs of all people. And Shannon, I'm just going to have you flip through some of these. and and. And here's why we think this matters so much. Um, you know, if we really are working towards this vision of what an inclusive and responsive democracy looks like, we see the centrality of um, full participation. So who votes matters. Um, elected officials and public policy responds to people who vote. And there's lots of research around that. Um, who's in office matters. You know, our, it's a lot easier to get the right people or the um, right people in office than it is to get the wrong people to do the right thing. So who's in office matters greatly. Who's counted in our census? Who's actually shaping policy in, in um, tables of power and in circles of power, both shaping change from the inside and shaping change from the outside? So we see social workers as um, really agents of change in all these um, different domains and, and really none of these, um, a, an inclusive democracy requires all of these to be in place. So um, let's flip to the next one. So in terms of what we do with the Humphreys Institute, and I'm so grateful Shannon leads our, um, we collaborate with, with researchers across the country and faculty across the country. Um, Shannon is the director of our, our research um, advisory board, but we, we really think about democracy as a practice sport. So we're always thinking of new ways to give social workers 
and students not just the, the skills and the, comp the competence to engage in democracy, but also the confidence. So, you know, giving them opportunities to, uh, to testify at the legislature, to engage um, people to vote while they're students. Um, we, we see nonpartisan voter engagement as a social work intervention that we'd like to include in all schools of social work. We think it's, we have a, we've been evaluating a model that can be integrated into any school of social work and any agency so that, you know, it can be part of um, services that social workers provide, you know, and, and, and I will caveat that a little bit later, but um, it's not that we're asking folks to do more because we know social workers already feel the burden of, of you know, doing too much, um, but really figuring out easy ways that we can engage people in the political process. And, and I think that this is really important to acknowledge now is that for a long time, and I feel like in our code of ethics and, and as a social worker, we get, we've always gotten a lot of shoulds, you know, you should be engaging voters or you should be um, participating politically, but we've never really operationalized it and figured out how people do that. So that's what we're trying to do at the Humphreys Institute is to really give people the skills that they need to do this. And um, lastly, I'll say that we are co-founders of the National Social Work Voter Mobilization Campaign um, the voting is social work, you may have heard, um, and, and which is trying to shape both social work practice and social work education. And Did I'm I just, anything? I don't think so, but I'm just going to add, although it's not the purpose of today, if any of y'all are in the North Carolina area, we do have our campaign school for social workers that Tanya mentioned briefly, um, that is going to be live and in person in North Carolina in, I'm not going to say how many days because it'll stress Tanya out, um, <laughs> but coming up later this month. And so if that's something you're interested in, we're going to give y'all our um, email addresses and contact info at the end of this. And so if you have questions about any of this um, as we go, you're welcome welcome um, to do a couple of things, right? You can throw questions and comments in the chat as we go. Um, you know, if you want to talk about your experience of voting or your experience of trying to get people to vote or sort of democracy in general, um, we would love to hear about your experiences. But also, um, you know, this is, you know, Tanya and I, this is the stuff that we talk about, you know, uh, for fun all the time. And so if you want to reach out to us separately from this presentation and ask for resources or get help or just have questions about any of this, um, please know that those are our, our favorite emails to get. We would love to, to hear from you. Well said. So um, Dr. Nancy Humphreys, who I mentioned earlier, was, was a professor of both Shannon and mine. Um, she was a, a mentor to both of us and, and really conceptualized this idea of political social work um, within our profession. And the way that Nancy originally conceived it was, was that if social workers are not um, working in political settings and helping to shape policy and at circles of, of within circles of power, excuse me, I needed something in my throat here, um, that, that others who are less qualified to shape policy and really don't understand how policy impacts communities um, that we serve, they will make those decisions without us. So she always um, looked at our profession as one, as, uh, of, as one of power. Um, Barbara Mikulski, who was the longest serving woman in, in the Senate, said social work, our politics is social work with power. And, and um, you know, I, I think she saw our capacity for change. She, she saw social workers as leaders. And I think that's incredibly important. Um, and, and really now when we think about political social work, it's been expanded to be more of an identity or more of a practice that we can all include in, in whatever setting we are working. So political action doesn't look the same. Some of us are much more embedded into direct practice, but can include and, and, and reach out to those of us who may be um, working full time within um, in political settings. So this is Dr. Humphreys there. She's, she's there with our, um, with, uh, Barbara Lee, who is a U.S. Congresswoman from California, and Dr. Charles Lewis is on, um, on her right from the Congressional Research Institute for Political Social Work.
Yep. And on the okay. left is former Representative Ed Towns, who founded the Social Work Caucus, uh, which uh, which uh, Barbara Lee took over when he retired as well. So these are some great political social workers here. Yes. So I hear a lot and more and more in uh, in from students and others that people don't vote. The number one reason people don't vote is they don't think it will make a difference. Things don't feel like they change. They ever change for some folks. And I think the part of that, it, that is a manufactured myth um, It is meant to keep people from exercising their right to vote. And I think the, and, and Shannon, if you can just advance it to the next one, I think part of that reason is that when, oh, I thought it was doing something different, but part of that reason is that when we think about voting, most people think about the president, right? So you, you think about voting for the, the president of the United States, and then when nothing changes, you feel like it's the same. And people are told that elections are rigged and that your vote doesn't matter. Well, it does. Um, and we know that because why would, why would states across the country be enacting voting restrictions? What we're seeing right now is this rollback of of democratic rights um, and and restrictions and and frankly it's working because voter it's it's getting harder and harder to vote. You want to ad advance mm -hmm. one more there? Uh, I mentioned this one. Sorry, I'm a little out of order here, but um, and and I think for everybody this is a really important um, moment in time to consider because when we think, as I said, and we think only about the federal uh, federal elections, which is the one where most people vote, right? So we had 67 million people vote in 2020. That was very high. But there was, an, there was across the country, after Obama was elected, there was a um, coordinated effort to change the power structure at the state and local level, particularly at the state level, when we think about 10 years ago. And you can see here, in 2008, these are this. The, this was the power control: um, um, blue being Democrat, red being Republican. But you can see that across the country, we were um, we were relatively mixed. They had tremendous success in the 2010 election, and the the reason that this is so important when we see this shift to red is that. Every 10 years, we conduct a census. And after that census, we draw district lines. So I'm sure many of you have heard across the country, you know, these district lines, which are um, gerrymandered uh, to favor one political party or another. That process is really terrible for democracy. It is partly um, to blame for the feeling that your vote doesn't matter, because if you are in a district where there is no competition, then you actually do feel like your vote doesn't matter. But what this has done had created a situation where we now have um, legislation across the country that really starts not at the federal level, but at the local level, I mean, at the state level, and, and they are being, it's been very effective. Shannon, do you want to advance and? Yeah, and I just wanted to add to that, we've got two really good examples of this, um, that of the way that gerrymandering has affected local politics here in, in Connecticut, where I live, which is, um, that we had one town in Connecticut which used redistricting as an excuse to cut the number of voting spots by two thirds. Um, and there was a big, uh, you know, a group of advocates got together and pushed back and were able to address that. But that comes as a result of, you know, the census and drawing the lines and, and gerrymandering. Um, and another where a district was redrawn um, because a state rep wanted to move. And so they redrew her district so that she could move and that her new house would be in her district and she could run for reelection. And so these are not necessarily partisan issues, right? These are these affect, these are tools that are used by both political parties and by people all over the country um, in ways that often do make us feel like, like our vote doesn't matter. Um, and I think, as Tanya said, we need to be aware of these and know that it's happening. Um, but we also, you know, coming back to the core of this session and thinking about the way that this um, that that racism plays into this is we know that the U.S. Census drastically undercounted people who are black, people who are Latino, Latina and people who are indigenous. And so for the next 10 years, we're going to deal with the results of that, that people are going to have less access to political power and less access to 
uh, resources uh, to do what they need to do in their communities. And so um, there's a lot of opportunities for social workers on the macro level to get engaged with this now. So we can start, we really need to start planning now for the, for the next census, which seems like a ridiculous thing to say. <laughs> Um, so keeping this, just to stick with the idea of what's happening at the state and local level right now, um, you know, depending on what state you live in, you're going to see a hugely different set of laws about things that are important to us as social workers and to us as individuals. And we also see, um, you know, a lot of these laws have, um, you know, they have, you know, white supremacy or racism built in at their core whether or not they are written with race neutral language, they are still designed for a systemically racist person purpose. And so as an example, I'll highlight, you know, the, the laws that make it harder for people in the United States to vote. Um, often those laws are, are designed like the Jim Crow laws, like our felony disenfranchisement laws to specifically uh, target folks who are black to keep them from having voting power. Um, the same with the penalties against demonstrators that have been passed in eight states. Those penalties passed after the Black Lives Matter movement started. You know, we didn't see those laws after the Tea Party movement. You know, we didn't see that kind of law in reaction to January 6th, right? Those laws were specifically designed um, to target people who protested after George Floyd's murder. Um, and so we can see this real importance that Yes, every four years, we try to make sure that people get out to vote for president, but also every two years for state and local elections. And in some places, you'll have many elections, you know, local elections, uh, special elections, uh, primaries, um, and your vote can really make a difference and your clients' votes can really make a difference. Um, one example that we wanted to highlight because it's been in the news so much lately are school boards, right? Um, and this picture at the top that says what's wrong about the truth really resonated with me because I was in a local Facebook group not a week ago and people were arguing about critical race theory, which is, you know, it's a it's a Trojan horse for just talking about race at all in our schools. And one of the people in this group said, I just think our kids are going through a lot right now and they don't need to, they don't need more truth, um, which I thought was just a really impressively interesting thing for someone to say. Um, but also what she was saying is my, right, she was saying my white kids don't need to learn about race. Like that truth is too hard for my kids. Um, and so when we look at school boards over the last year, we've seen debates on critical race theory. We've seen debates about other issues around diversity and equity in the curriculum. We see, um, you know, issues around how masking was carried out in school, how, you know, remote schooling was carried out in ways that, you know, benefited some students and kept particularly low income students from accessing a good education over the last two years. So school boards matter. They matter tremendously. Um, I, um, I had the opportunity to run for school board last year. Um, I'm not supposed to say that I lost. I'm supposed to say our friend Kate Coyne McCoy says that I'm supposed to say that I didn't win. Um, and I didn't win by 47 votes, which was hard. Um, but it was a really amazing opportunity for me because I was able to have conversations with people about a lot of the things that are important to us as social workers, including the fact that we're the only so school in our district that doesn't have a social worker on staff and doesn't have adequate mental health services for our students. And I think most of you probably know we are in an epidemic right now on top of the other epidemics we're in. We are in an epidemic of mental health crisis for children and adolescents. And, um, and so school boards are one place that we can start to make sure that those resources are available. Um, and school board elections are often decided by very few votes, like my 47 vote difference, right? Because not a lot of people vote in local elections. And if they do, they sort of maybe they vote for mayor and they just sort of stop voting as they go down. So this is one place that as social workers and as our clients, we can really, our vote can really make a difference. Do you wanna talk about non-voting now, Tanya? I do, and I'm going to go through the next few slides relatively quickly. We do wanna, we wanna get to you, get you some action steps, but I think it's really important to understand um, who's voting right now and and the sheer number voting is about relationships it's not only about your relationship um, it's a very relational behavior and it is also um, 
it, it's related to your trust in, in your government. So when we look at the presidential election, as we said, most people think about that turnout. Now in 2020, just to show you, we, we increased um, the number of people who turned out to vote by 20 million voters, which seems high, except for the fact that you can see that we had a third of people, a third of our, our eligible electorate stayed home. And I think what was so interesting is that graphic on the right shows you that in the 2016 election, we had more non-voters than the number of people who voted for either candidate um, Hillary Clinton or um, uh, the winner of that election, um, Donald Trump. So the non-voters have a tremendous impact on our elections. Um, and you can see in terms of who does vote, I, we will share these slides and, and, it, and we won't get into the weeds, but you know, we, we have 20 million people in our country will speak to this um, with a felony conviction. And in this last election, um, we had nearly 5,000 who were ineligible because of a felony conviction. But what happens is that because the rules are, are decided state by state, because there is a lot of misinformation, we call it de facto disenfranchisement. So really those numbers are, are lower across the board because of misinformation. So that's that will be one of our action steps that we'll talk a little bit more about. Why don't we go to the next slide? And so we're looking at this from a national level, but let's look at the turnout on the, on the state and local level as we were just speaking about nationally, when we look at, or nationally about, about 50 to 67% of people vote in, in presidential elections. And on the state level, it's about 50%. So one in two voters vote every two years, which it happens to also for most states fall in line with the midterm elections. So we get about a 50% turnout. But when we look at them at the local level, and in some cases, the state level, there are some states like New Jersey and Virginia that vote, um, whose states vote in odd years. So we, you can see an, an average voter turnout of 25%. Now, for people like me who get really into the weeds of, of voter turnout, both within communities and across states, across the state, this varies significantly. And, and it is a generalization, but I will, I will share with you that generally um, more educated and more well and wealthier communities turn out in higher rates. And it's no surprise that communities that are most impacted by over incarceration, that are impacted by arrest rates, that we see the lowest voter turnout. In part because of that uh, that disenfranchisement that I was speaking, but speaking about, but also you know the foundations of civic life are start in communities and in families. And so when we think about having the right to vote taken away by somebody who has um, been you know, impacted by the criminal justice system, we see a, a cascading effect in families and communities in lowering political power. And, and the last thing I wanna say about that and, and why it's so important when we go down to that local level is that even in communities like um, you know, underserved communities and cities, when you have 10, 15, 20, 25 percent of people turning out to vote, that's very concentrated and often toxic political power because, you know, the system's public policy responds to, to voters. And so that particular, you know, that's a concentrated amount of power for those people who did turn out. And, and then when we think about how candidates are chosen and we think about the small number of people actually participating in democracy, deciding who will be on the ballot, um, not just who's, who's running for office. You know, we, we, we see that it is too, um, it, it's a very small circle of people. And so that's what we're really out to change. And let's go to- well, Let me, I just want to add one thing to that. And I also want to point out, right, because we're in a pandemic and life is always challenging. I have a, a guest here, my daughter's home today. So, um, you know, and I think Tanya mentioned family, right? So we'll, we'll segue into family. But I also wanted to add that I think sometimes in the national media, you'll see a lot of criticism of people who don't vote. And that's really not our purpose, right? People don't vote often for a reason, right? They don't vote because they don't see the system caring about them. And when they do vote, 
they don't see a difference happening. And so I think as social workers, you know, to go back to that core social work skill of meeting people where they're at, I think, you know, our job is not to tell people what to do or that what they're doing is wrong, but to help understand what what the reason is for the actions they've taken um, and offer them um, some tools for that. Um, I also just wanted to highlight, we've got a couple of comments. Um, you know, Maggie mentioned when we were talking about all this stuff happening at the state level that it sometimes feels like that's hard to find a safe state. Um, and Tamara mentioned that she lives in a red state but has blue discussions and models blue behavior. And I think that's really important, right? I mean, I, you know, I live in and work in Connecticut now. I grew up in South Dakota. And it can be a really different experience trying to be an advocate depending on your state. But often, even within your state, if we look at the local level, there are really targeted actions that we can take that might be in line with your values and, and help to move the needle forward, even if at the state level or at the federal level, you're not seeing the change that you want to. Um, so we can't talk about voting without talking about Stacey Abrams and John Lewis. And so we wanted to, um, as we move into sort of what you can do um, in these areas, we wanted to give you two quotes. So from Stacey Abrams, who says, we need active and relentless participation in our elections and our government. Um, and as I said before, sometimes that feels overwhelming or it feels tiring. And I think that's part of why working as a collective, right, as part of the national social work um, community to do this work can help that feel more possible and feel less overwhelming. Um, and then uh, our late Congressman John Lewis said, your vote is precious, almost sacred. It is the most powerful nonviolent tool we have to create a more perfect union. And so we want you to keep those um, ideas in mind as we talk about really, you know, moving from the lay of the land um, into some action steps here. Um, so Tanya, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, and, and I think this is this is why we're focusing on all of this back information. Um, I would imagine that we have some incredibly dedicated voters um, in this space today. And I um, and I think sometimes it feels like we're preaching to the choir, but at the same time, what we know and at, at the University of Connecticut uh, School of Social Work, where um, I am an alumna, alumni also teaching on the faculty now, but but for years at the Humphreys Institute, we would put together um, these packets of information for social work students and say, please run voter registration drives at your agencies. And um, we'd give them everything they needed to do. We'd do a little bit of rah-rah, but honestly, we we did not move the needle. And it wasn't until we started talking about why voting matters to students and to faculty and to social workers around the country that people started to um, get excited about it. So I think everybody's why is a little bit different, but I think it's also um, not recognized that, that the practice of voting forget about who you're voting for, but this practice of voting is really good for individuals and communities. So there's lots of information, there's lots of research showing that communities that vote in higher rates receive more attention and more resources from, um, from elected officials. Public policy reflects their needs most. Um, but, but voting on the individual level, there are some studies that show that that can be also um, a powerful act because you know this individual act of voting is is one of power, and so for example, young people who vote, they are it, voting is correlated with future earnings and future education. So um, some there's been a study that shows that that the act of voting can serve to offset some of the effects of oppression. Now, again, there's very few studies on the individual level, but there are many studies showing that communities that vote in higher rates rebound from recessions. They um, have better rates of health and mental health, that their education, higher rates of education. So when we look at it, we think about it as a social determinant of health. Um, we also think about it as a, as a powerful human right and connect, obviously, these sy systemic barriers that are, that are baked into our democracy as, as really a violation of, of human rights. And when we talk about felony disenfranchisement, which we will 
several times today. Um, you know, those those laws were were built to restrict political power of African Americans and other groups. So so addressing voting rights is really central to human rights. And and again, when we go back to that power of voting. There are, there are several studies that show voting, the act of voting is so powerful that it actually reduces recidivism rates. So when you give a formerly incarcerated or disenfranchised voter the right back, that, that recidivism rates drop significantly. So again, we, we get at this from all different rates and I have been known even to have my students go and Google themselves to say your voting record is also a public record. So I, I'm a little bit shameless in terms of trying to get young people um, to see the importance of, of participating in elections, but um, it really is the way that I think that we will be addressing um, and creating a public policy that works for all people. Yeah, and I just wanna ask folks to sort of answer this question in the chat, the what is your why? You know, we don't, um, you know, I think, most of us come to thinking about democracy and thinking about voting because it matters to us because there's a uh, you know a particular social problem we want to address or a particular community that's important to us. So I'd love to see you just throw in the chat like what is your why for why voting is important to you or why changing our system is important to you. Um, I also wanted to answer um, Robin had a great question in the chat where she essentially asked if the the research showing that there's good health benefits for communities that vote whether sort of what's the directionality of it. So my my research professor Hart is very happy to hear this question. Right, are communities better off? because people vote or do people vote because their communities are better off? And the answer to that is really both, right? Because in a lot of ways we do, we see in communities that have more access to resources and an easier process of voting, we see a, a longer time period of being able to vote. But we also do have some of these like sort of natural experiments, right? Where a group of people will be given access to the right to vote. And so we can watch and see how that affects their community. Um, a great example of that is in Florida a couple of years ago passed a statewide uh, change to their constitution, which now allows people with felony convictions to, to access their right to vote again. And that was an incredible grassroots movement um, in the state of Florida. And so I do think uh, we can see as a result of that, that those folks who were formerly barred from being able to vote, but now are able to vote, we can see the positive uh, physical and mental health effects for them and their communities. Um, so I appreciate that question, Robin. It's a great one and one that, that we think about a lot. Um, and I hope you all are checking out the chat. It's just exploding with people who are talking about voting um, to find better solutions because of social justice, to make things more equitable, to make a better future for their children, which I completely agree with, uh, to get a more inclusive government, human rights, change the system, um, you know, this, this is, this, your why is so important and it's so important to all the work that we're doing, but it's also gonna be what helps you stay in the work when it gets hard and frustrating. Um, and, and um, you know, sometimes it takes a long time to get some of these victories. So, so knowing these whys uh, is really important. So keep those coming. And all Robin, right, Tanya. oh, go ahead. Robin gave us the perfect segue for the next slide because I love the folks um, who put together this democracy health index. And I think this is, this is one of the most powerful slides to me that I've been using since it came out this year. They mapped um, voting policy. So they, they looked at states and, and there are certain voting policies or, or that, that make voting easier that, um, that they put all together. So for example, if you can register and vote in the same day, that is that is a pro-voting policy. States that have early voting, states that have no excuse absentee voting, states that have mail-in voting um, exclusively. There are five states in our country where you can vote by mail. Um, and so when they, they, they took those policies so that every state would come up with a score on how easy it was to vote, and then they took outcomes and came up with scores around health outcomes, around poverty. And I think there's 12 that they, they 12 different kinds of measurements of, of well-being that they, that they mapped along this, this graph. And so the states to the right, it, to the right of the, of the y-axis, that's easier to vote. So you can see, and, and I'm on a laptop, so my, and my eyes are terrible, so I can't. But but those are the states where we would expect to see. Um, we know that voting is easier. Those states that have mail-in voting, like 
um, Utah and Colorado. And then you see states where voting is much more difficult. And you can see that this correlation, this strong correlation between health outcomes and voting. Again, making that case that voting really is connected to the outcomes and, um, that, that, that we think about um, as social workers. And so I encourage you to go to this website. You can, it's very, very simple to use and there are about 12 different indicators. So thanks Robin for that question. And somebody just asked for the slides. We're gonna give you our contact information at the end and you're welcome to reach out for the slides or for any anything else we can do to help. So now we're gonna um, get a little bit more into the action piece here. And I have, um, I have my lanyard that I wear all the time. So voting is really about relationships and this is what we do well. Um, and we, we, think, and we think that social workers are the perfect um, people to be engaging uh, communities and individuals to vote. And again, every one of us has a different level uh, you know, our jobs are different, but but nonpartisan voter engagement is legal, ethical, and in some cases mandated by, by law. We have a motor voter law that the 1993 Voter Registration Act that was passed actually requires so nonprofits who are registering individuals for federal benefits to be offering people the opportunity to register to vote. But, but what we know about this work is that the opportunity can be just a bunch of forms on a, on a table. And so voting is really about conversations. Democracy is about conversations. So this is where we excel. We think about voting not as an I activity, but a we activity in terms of building collective power in communities. Um, we know that, that you know, we can be doing this. And I think I jumped to the next slide already, Shannon. So sorry about that. I, I didn't tell you to, to move on. But, but so engaging people from micro to macro. So what do people need? The when, where, how to vote. Um, the reminder that their vote matters. The willingness to engage in that conversation. To remind them that when they stay home, their, the power in their community um, is diminished. And, and again, when we go back to voter turnout, if you can, if you ever get a chance to see the voter turnout in your town or your city and you look across the city, you can often see the story of power in your community because the communities that turn out in higher rates often will see municipal, municipal policies that benefit those communities. So perhaps it's more lighting, perhaps it's the better schools, perhaps it's the better roads. This is a story, voting is always a story of power when we think about it as a we activity. And then in terms of macro social workers, those of you who identify as macro social workers, you know, really working to um, fix these systemic barriers that, that are meant to make people uh, to make voting more difficult and to feed the manufactured myth and narrative that the vote doesn't matter. And one of the best ways to do that is to work the polls at election day. If you are eligible to vote in the U.S., you are eligible to be a poll worker. And um, it's often a really phenomenal opportunity just to get a better understanding of the process. I've been a poll worker uh, since 2016, and I understand voting in a completely different way than I did before I started working the polls. Um, it's also um, bonus poll workers almost everywhere in the United States get paid. Um, and so it can be an opportunity to get to know voting better and serve your community and uh, make some money. Um, so go ahead. did you want to add something? Well, I think I was also going to add that you're the deputy registrar of voters in your town. <laughs> I am the deputy registrar of voters in my town and I get to hire poll workers. And it's one of the best things that I do all year because I get to make sure that when my folks in my community are interacting with voters, they're doing it in a way that is um, very social work values friendly, right? That we're abiding by state laws and we're making everybody who walks in the polling place feel like they're welcome and that their vote is important and that um, even though it requires me getting up at four o'clock in the morning several times a year, um, it's still a really uh, a really good thing to do. Um, and I see in the chat that some states offer CEUs for working the polls. Ohio 
nicely done. I had no idea. I'm immediately going to start researching whether or not we could do this in other places. So uh, Hannah, thank you so much for that. Um, and Lynn pointed out that people have to work on election day. Election day should be a holiday, to which I say, absolutely, yes. Um, and the other thing that we're seeing across the country is that it, we're making early voting more accessible, um, allowing people to vote by mail-in so that it's not just about being available between 6 a.m. and 8 p.m on the second Tuesday in November, but really voting at a time and a place and a way that works for you. And those are some of those ways that we can, um, on the macro level, start to wake, make um, voting more accessible for people. Yeah, I, in, and let me add the most powerful, um, the, the policy that has most, most impact on turnout is same day voter registration. So if you had to choose between having one thing or the other, I would say um, we should all be working to have same day voter registration in our states. Um, and so I just also have to add that Hannah also says that in Columbus, Ohio, all public transportation is free on election day. And I will tell you as a University of Michigan grad, it is very painful for me to say that I now wanna to move to Columbus, Ohio. That is awesome. Thank you for sharing that, Hannah. And these are great ideas for policies that you can take back to your towns and states and advocate for them. Um, because these are some of the ways that we can make voting much more accessible to folks. Yeah, Columbus is actually, we did a campaign school for social workers in Columbus, Ohio, and I was so impressed by the work that's being done there. And, you know, and you never know, you, every state has their own, um, every secretary of state across the country, there is a, a main elections page. And, you know, some of the states where I would expect the page to be terrible, the page is fantastic. And, and in our state in Connecticut, I, you know, I would expect it to be amazing. And it's actually sometimes not very helpful. So, so always check out those resources. And I think that's the, the first point of this next slide, or this slide here is really, it's really important that we know the voting laws in our state. Who can vote with a felony conviction? Who can vote um, you know, is that question alone, social workers who don't know the answer can perpetuate, um, you know, some uh, harm people and keep them from exercising their right to vote. Again, it's confusing. All 50 states, we have two states that you can vote while you're incarcerated and the other 48, it's some version of um, parole or probation or right after incarceration, or after incarceration ends. But again, the, how you get re-registered, what some states bar people for the rest of their lives, depending on the, um, the conviction and what that was for. So it's meant to be confusing. We need to know the rules. And, and then, you know, we are using technology to, to make this work easier. So there are, if we go to the next slide. Well, Hank, can I just, oh, I want to yes. talk about the tech, but before we do that, I just wanted to say a little bit about, so in this slide, when we're talking about voting rights restoration, and I want to highlight this because I know this session coming up after us is about mass incarceration. And there are huge connections between our voting laws and our criminal justice laws in the United States. And the bulk of those laws go back to Jim Crow. And they essentially go back to the days when, you know, the in the United, you know, the end of the Civil War, the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment made it now no longer um, possible to just blanket disallow folks who were black from voting. And so states needed to come up with a new way so that white people in those states could retain their political power. And our felony voting laws in this country were one way to do that. And if you look at the core of those laws, the way they were originally written, they are very blatantly racist. The way they're written today, they're written in race neutral language, they're still very blatantly racist. And uh, connecting your right to vote to your felony conviction is something that often people accept as just a, a, an obvious thing now, but is not was not true for most of our uh, country's history. Um, and so uh, Tanya and I wrote an article really calling social work to task that we need to be more involved in fighting these restrictions on um, restricting voting rights for people with felony convictions. Um, and I'm gonna give you my website at the end of this. You can find it on my website or you can email us for it if you're interested. Um, but this is such an important place because these are laws that hugely affect communities of color, people who are um, you know, below the poverty level, like the, the communities that we care about as social workers. Um, and so you know, this is something that I think is, as a profession, 
we have to stand up and say that we're not going to put up with this anymore because it it goes against the social work code of ethics um, to to take away a voice from uh, people who've already been um, been discriminated against in so many ways. All right, I had to get my soapbox out, Tanya. Now I'll let no, you talk no. about the power of three. <laughs> No, and thank you for that. And we also have a toolkit. We've been doing that work in Connecticut. We have a toolkit that we'd be happy to send you that could be modified for other states. Sample testimony. We've been working with um, grassroots organizations on, on talking points and the history of, of, of these laws. We've got a um, whole list of, of templates that you could use for your state. So let us know if you if you want that. You can email me and I'll be happy to send that out. We will be adding it to the Voting and Social Work website as well. So now is my call to action to all of you. I, I don't know if you can see it, but technology is making this work easier. Remember we said that um, it, it is difficult to know the rules in all 50 states, but we have ways to make this easier that, that also uh, help those of you who are in states with very restrictive um, registration requirements like Texas and Kansas right now. Um, technology, we think, makes this, um, makes this easier because people can actually be registering themselves. So the Power of Three campaign from the National Social Work Voter Mobilization Campaign, we are, we are asking all social workers across the country to engage three voters this year. So, and then get them to engage three voters. So we see social workers, there are 700,000, more than 700,000 social workers in our country. And imagine if all of us engage just three people. And so here is the, here's how we're doing this. We are partnering, there's an organization called VoteR that was started by Dr. Um, Alistair Martin. And he is a fantastic voting advocate. And he, he's a, a, he was an ER doctor who was working with a social worker who was trying to get, Massachusetts is a, a right to housing state and was trying to get somebody into a shelter that night. And the social worker suggested, well, why don't you register the, um, register the mom to vote? So he started to realize that, that hospitals, no matter where we're practicing, we can be making that simple connection to getting people registered to vote. And so we're partnering with them. We're using a tool, a platform called um, TurboVote. And what, we, what you do is you have these, these QR codes and people can point their smartphone right to the code. I don't know if you have your smartphone handy, but if you point it to this QR code, even if you're registered, if you enter your um, if you enter your cell phone number or your email address, you will get not only a reminder to vote, but they will tell you where you were registered and where to vote um, before every election. So we think about primaries, we think about special elections, think about the power of getting a reminder before every local election. These tools are making this easier. So I wear mine every single day. Um, it starts a conversation. You can get one at uh, vote, vot-er.org, or you can go to voting is social work. You can get, we've got palm cards, we've got screensavers, we've got every tool to make this easier for you. If you are doing um, a presentation in your agency, we will send you some slides that you can use. So we, we want this to be easy for you to do. And, and when I talked about this, this um, also a safe way for people to mail or uh, to vote in, in those states like Texas, where not everybody can be registering others to vote, this using technology like this is actually somebody registering themselves. And I think that's a really important Thing to emphasize here, that when we use this type of technology, people are registering themselves through their smartphone. If they do not have, if they live in a state without online voter registration, they, TurboVote will mail them a paper form with a self-addressed stamped envelope. So again, very important, to the, these techno this technology is making it easier to engage the, the communities where we live and and work yeah 
And I just wanted to highlight Lynn in the comments said that she has a lanyard from Boat ER, so that is awesome. It's good to hear. Um, and Jennifer also started a, a really healthy uh, set of uh, questions um, by asking, so she said she'd like to encourage people to vote, but also she lives in a, a red area, so maybe the people she would be voting have different perspectives from her. Um, so I, I think that's a great question, Jennifer, and you know, people have have raised some some potential solutions to that. I do think that we need to separate out thinking about registering voters um, in a nonpartisan way from a partisan way. So sometimes what we want to do is we want to work in a partisan way, right? So you know you might want to run for office and register voters so they can vote for you, or you might want to work for a local candidate or political party. And in that situation, then we are asking people to vote in a particular way. But most of the voter registration we do as social workers is nonpartisan, which is where essentially we're giving people the information and allowing them to make their choices. And I think a couple of people have commented um, in the chat that, you know, we want to try to be we want to try not to play favorites and we want to, you know, sort of make sure that we're adhering to the code of ethics. And I think that's true. But I also think it's OK to acknowledge the fact that, like, I often will remind people in my family to go vote, even if I know that the person they're going to vote for is not the person I'm going to vote for. And that is a hard it's not I just I want to validate that that is a hard dilemma to have as we go into the last three minutes here that we could talk about this for another hour, right? Um, but I think there's no one right answer to that. But I think you've um, given given her some good good suggestions on that. I, I agree. Keep it out of it. It's really important that we that we never tell people who to vote for. In our in our role as social workers, I'm sure we all have deep conversations with family and friends. Um, I know I do. So Again, if you think about your networks and think about the power of asking your networks to register three people um, to vote and actually remind them to get to the polls, we, we, we do encourage people to remember that we can't stop at registration and it's actually, um, it doesn't matter unless they, they cast their ballot on election day. But the, the, this campaign has been endorsed by all almost all of our professional associations when we think about um, those that we belong to as social workers, including the Council on Social Work Education, which um, accredits schools of social work across the country. So I think, you know, it's really important for us to, to acknowledge that because for a long time, I think that there was a feeling that we couldn't do this work, that it was too political. And when we stay nonpartisan, this is, this is not only is it, um, is it ethical and professional, but you know, it really helps us adhere to our, our code of ethics and it's part of empowerment, pro empowerment practice. And so I will end, this is a, the Voting and Social Work website. You can get questions to um, answers to all the questions that you may have if you're working with special populations like folks experiencing homelessness or folks that have been survivors of um, domestic violence, there are populations, we address all of those questions on the Voting and Social Work website. Here is our contact information, um, and we are happy to provide more information if you send us an email. Um, I think it's there. What did I miss, Shannon? No, I think that's great. There are, you know, I Often we hear from people who say, oh, I have this specific concern um, and, uh, you know, specific population and you are not the only person working with that population and we're happy to connect you with other folks doing that. Um, so we just wanted to say thank you again to Deanna and Social Work Helper. You also might have noticed in the little video clip about Social Work Helper that in the Social Work Helper app, you can register people to vote. So you've got lots of different ways to do this. Um, and I know there's so much more valuable information that's coming at you in the next couple of days. We're just so grateful to be a part of it and to get to talk to you all. And um, again, we just please really reach out if there's anything that we can do to help you with any of this voting, political, democracy, macro social work stuff. Um, we would love to, to be a resource for you. Yes. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to be with all of you. And um, we hope to work with you more in the future. Thank you.